Hi everyone, Oli here, and this is my review of The King's Demons. The sixth and final story of the 20th season of Classic Doctor Who, starring Peter Davison as the fifth Doctor. The King's Demons is the 129th story overall. Mm. It's two parts long and it's written by Terence Dudley. So the plot of The King's Demons is as follows England, March 1215. King John is visiting the castle of Sir Ranulph Fitzwilliam. The arrival of the TARDIS disturbs the medieval joust, but the Doctor and his companions are proclaimed to be friendly demons by the King, who seems strangely interested in their blue engine. It soon becomes clear that neither King John or his champion, Sir Julius Estrum, are who they say who they pretend to be. One of the Doctor's oldest and deadliest enemies threatens the future mm. of democracy of Earth and must be stopped. And that is the plot of the King's Demons. So in my opinion, I think the King's Demons is a very fun story. It's written in the same vein as season 19's Black Orchid, which Terence Dudley also wrote, but here the thoughts are slightly more jarring. I thought the production was quite good. I loved the medieval setting of the King's Demons, and it's been quite a quite a fair mm. bit since we've seen since we've seen the medieval story in Doctor Who. So it's a nice change to different historical stories, where it's pretty much been. If it's probably either been in at least, let's say, Victorian London or Edwardian London or whatever, but then having it set in medieval, it set in medieval times is quite interesting. I like the sets of King Ch- of King John, and the location for me was quite good. There were some good action scenes, more specifically the the sword fight between the Doctor and the Master, which was actually done by Peter Davison and Anthony Ainley themselves. Which I thought was quite impressive, and I actually mirrored the the, the scene that was when the Doctor and the Master were having their sword fight in the prison. The st- the script was alright, and the direction by Tony Virgo was good as well. And I think this is the only story that he actually directed for Doctor, and it wasn't actually so bad. The plot was okay, suitable for a two part, and not much to complain about. The plot, aside from the issues which I'll touch upon later, the story was very theatrical, which gives it some appeal and some personality, and. The plot of the Master wanting to steal the Magna Carta, well, not steal the Magna Carta, to prevent it from being signed, was, I think it could have been expanded on a little bit, a bit, but I, but I think it would have been better, it would have been told better if it was a four-parter, then that's pretty much all I can say in terms of the plot. Fairly good moments in the story, like the Tardis standing in the middle of the joust, and the Doctor, Tegan, and Tola were called demons, and oddly enough welcome to King John's court, and were treated like guests, for the most part. Well, King John was actually chameleon, and Andrew didn't disguise, so it makes sense as to why he was very welcoming towards the Doctor and his companions. And I liked the sword fights between the Doctor and the Master at the end of part one, which was quite done. It was very memorable, so to speak. And I liked the ending when when the Doctor and Colongo chameleon escaped in the TARDIS. That was quite memorable. And then especially, I also find it quite funny when Turlo was actually threatening the Master with a sword, and then the Doctor quickly had to call Turlo back into the TARDIS, which was actually quite funny, so to speak. So onto the performances, which I think were all right. Peter Davison was quite good. I liked how the Doctor immediately deduces during the first part that something is very off of King John, and he realized where they landed, and because King John was actually in London, the real King John, and the Doctor is able to put two and two together and finds out that the Master is behind the plot. And the Doctor naturally wants to stop now. I do think that Peter Davison was actually affected by the campiness of the story and the Doctor does have some very campy theatrical moments. He does pull it off. He was able to do the sword fight scene very by himself which was quite cool and I must admit I loved how he briefly takes charge in getting people to listen to him before the Master shows up properly. Uh, but I liked how the Doctor was able to get the Master's TCE from him but then the Master mocked him said he won't actually use it on him but then I think this is the first one of the first instances where the Doctor actually does care for the Master when when Ronald wanted the Master tortured but then the Doctor said no, exercise some leniency on him and in the, actually, in an actual fact, I think the torture device, I think it was the, called the Iron Maiden, was actually the Master's TARDIS. Janet Fielding was alright, Tegan practically does nothing from this story and except for a, a little subplot in part 2 when she spends when she pilots the TARDIS for a little bit and then she does spend most of the part when interacting with the Doctor and a few characters. I do, I do find that a little disappointing. Mark Strickson was alright as well. He doesn't he doesn't really do anything either and in the first part he's immediately thrown into the prison cells and remains there for the rest of part one and then part two he meets the Master and 
and the master was able to convince everyone else that the doctor is evil and and then the master tells Ranulph and so pardon me turns tells Isabel Isabella and Ranulph that Tolo is the doctor's friend and he's evil as well so Tolo does spend most of the story getting captured and or getting dragged around by security by by guards and it's rather disappointing as well because it's as if there was nothing much for Tolo can do after the Black Guardian trilogy. Now, I do like how he actually threatened the master with a sword after being caught back to the TARDIS by the Doctor. And I think that scene, as well as in Nightmare, was quite evident that Mark, that Mark Strickson can actually do Hammy acting very well. And we have a new companion in Chameleon. He's a shape-shifting android that the master is able to use to escape it's from Xerophas after time flight. Chameleon takes the form of King John and later took from other characters as well, like the Doctor and Tegan. He is voiced by Gerald Flood, who also plays King John, and King John was quite hammy, and Flood does a good job of that and doing that as well, and I, will, whenever he, and I always find it funny whenever King John would actually refer to the Doctor and his companions as demons, which was <laughs> quite funny if you think about it, and unfortunately, this is actually, the next time we actually see Chameleon is in Planet of Fire, in which he's destroyed. He does appear in... A deleted scene and I think it was The Awakening or he was but then they actually filmed it but then it never made it to air on television. And so the comedian proper is actually a real or legit robot and and I think John Nathan Turner wanted the comedian to be the next canine but it turned out to be a complete disaster because nobody knew how to operate the prop and one of the people I think the only the person that created the robot unfortunately ended up dying so he didn't really write a manual or anything, so he was just pretty much there. There, and it just, and I, and I think his the creator did pretty much threw a big spanner in the works, and, well then, and it, and it actually, it was quite a pain to film, because it would just randomly stop working whenever they wanted to use the prop, so, so even though Kameen being an actual robot was pretty cool, but then obviously due to unforeseen circumstances, it was a huge pain to use at times, so, Comedian is just very much forgotten about, and I think the storyline reason as to why Comedian wasn't used in other stories because he didn't want to fall influenced, fall under the evil influence of villains in other stories. So, on to the characters. First off, we had Sir Ranulph Fitzwilliam. He is an English knight. He decided to give his entire fortune to King John to aid the Crusades. The king wanted more, which did upset him, and then the doctor wanted to help Ranulph, which he accepted, but then he decided to take back the Doctor's help and the Master convinced them that the Doctor was evil. Isabella was Ranulph's wife. She was imprisoned by the Master and she, so she was, so he, he can try and like, she was basically used as leverage to try and get Ranulph to obey the Doctor. And then Hugh, who was Sir Ranulph's son, he lost the joust of Giles Estrem, who was actually the Master in disguise. He was imprisoned also, but he had to obey the Master and Lastly, we had Sir Geoffrey de Lacy. He's Ranulph's cousin. He went to London to swear the Crusaders' oath, where he met the king. He was returning to Fitzwilliam Castle, where he met Sir Giles, and was actually arrested. And he actually met the king, well, who was actually a chameleon, but then after he was instructed by the doctor to warn the real king to join over what's happening, and then he was later shot in the back of a crossbow. He was the only character in the story that actually died. Right, but then before he died, he said the king, Doctor Seek, which automatically led the others to think that the doctor was somehow responsible. So obviously the master is the main enemy of the story. Having escaped from Zerifast, he was able to get a hold of Chameleon, who tool used in the early invasion of Zerifast, and he used that to pretend to be King John to prevent the Magna Carta from being signed. The real King John was actually in London, so the master was in disguise again as... Sir Giles, Sir Giles Estrum, and obviously Estrum being an anagram of the master, although the E is actually missing. Anthony, any his performance was okay here, but it's pretty obvious that the master was just putting the story just for the sake of it. So I think the thoughts this story had was that it was pretty obvious that Sir Giles Estrum was the master without even having to look at it. It was just pretty, can meet, pretty much see through the disguise, and I think it was just becoming a very tired plot device, so to speak. I mean, and I think it was just... Other plots are just used in other stories, are just used once again. Like, everyone 
believing the doctor at first and then the master comes in and the master convinces everyone that the doctor is evil and has to be stopped. Which I think we were just getting boring at some point. And I also thought that the part when the doctor and the master were having like this sort of Battle of the Widows thought it was quite strange. It didn't really make any sense. This was with with Kameen how I think Kameen turned into the doctor or something. It was just quite strange to be honest. Tegan and Turner do actually do nothing in the story. Turner spends most of the story getting captured by guards and Tegan basically just follows the Doctor like a lost like a lost puppy in part one and then she tries to pilot the TARDIS again in part two and that was pretty much it. And well she, Tegan does have a change of clothes. Not she's not wearing the boob tube as Janet Fielding put it earlier. So she's wearing a different outfit. It's just something similar to her season twenty one out her season twenty one outfit, but yeah, so that's a nice change. But then also, other than that, I just think Tegan didn't really do much of anything in the story. And there was a part I also didn't really like. I think it was at the end of the story when Chameleon was in the TARDIS and Tegan was still rather not really trusting the Chameleon. And then she tells the Doctor that he'll take... that. He, she tells the Doctor and the Doctor pretty much responds saying that he'll take her back to Earth if she doesn't be quiet, which I did find a bit unnecessary because... Seeing that Kamina was literally under the master's influence, anything could happen, and I do think that Tegan was quite justified in her voicing her complaints, and the doctor just pretty much brushed it off, and I do think that was a bit unfair. So to conclude, I think the King's Demon is a nice, fun two-part breeze to end the season, well, because it was supposed to have been a Dalek story, supposed to have ended the season, but I think there was like a production strike or something, so... It was a nice way to end the season after dealing with the likes of Omega, the Mara and the Black Guardian. But I think having the story two parts pretty much exposed a lot of the faults. So I gave the King's Demon a 7 out of 10. So that's it for season 20. Join me next time as I rank all six stories of season 20. Thanks for watching. Please let me know your thoughts of the King's Demons and this review. Subscribe to the channel if you've done so. Have you done so already? Click the, subs click the bell to be notified on my... Other videos I'll post. Until then, see you later.